This is the man that we've all come to see here today. He's a um, you know, very accomplished uh, academic and a scholar, but he's also uh, very highly regarded in the uh, ceremonial way of life of uh, the Anishinaabe nation. And he's a Medewin leader, a Medewin headman, and a pipe carrier and a ceremonial person. And uh, in addition to educating a lot of uh, students at Bemidji State University, he also educates a lot of people in uh, the Midday way of life and the Midday, um, the Midday teachings. So he is a very good role model for all of you uh, students and all of you, um, you know, young people who are trying to navigate a career and education and also trying to make space for your identity and culture here in the mainstream uh, academic environment, but also in the mainstream urban environment because he is somebody who's doing it, and he's demonstrating that you don't need to give up anything. You can have everything, right? You can have career and achievement and excellence and also be a strong cultural person and a traditional person. So he's gonna have a lot of specific insight, experience to share with you, but I hope that you appreciate also just you know, what he's able to do in being who he is and uh, that you're able to perhaps take some inspiration and some, uh, some uh, motivation from that. And I was talking to uh, some of the elders here, Mary and Ruth, and they said, yeah, he's, uh, he does all that, but he's really, he's really good looking too. <laughs> and that's why people listen to him. <laughs> so that's the other thing. You guys gotta be really good looking also, in addition to, be a, to being a scholar and uh, a traditional person. So we're setting the bar high here at the University of Winnipeg. Speaking of which, um, we've got lapel pins at the back of the room. They're these pewter, so they're silver in color. Um, any student who's an indigenous student or just a, a student of U of W who um, wants to be a good ally is uh, welcome to come and get one. It says UW indigenous on them. Craig is uh, just picking one up right here. And so those are available to everyone, but the promise that I'm making to each and every one of you uh, first-year students is this. If you complete a four-year degree within four years, meaning you carry a full course load through your four-year four degree and you graduate on time, I'll give you a gold one. All right? So in order to uh, track that, just um, leave your name with Sarah. She has a kind of a sign-in sheet, Sarah, at the back of the room there and we'll uh, do all that we can to support you guys in a good way. But I'm very happy to see you all here today. I think it's a great, great uh, thing that you guys all came out here to learn more about the language and how to revitalize Anishinaabe Moen and Nehiya Moen and you know, uh, the Dakota language and uh, Michif and Dene and uh, Inuktitut and all these languages that we are uh, gifted to ha privileged to have here in uh, Manitoba Bing. So without further ado, I'll introduce, uh, you know, this guy, his name is uh, Wagush, and uh, he's known in uh, the academic world as Dr. Anton Troyer. He's a professor and also an administrator at the Bemidji State University, publisher of many books, in two of which are for sale at the back of the room uh, by UW Bookstore. One is a profile on the uh, Red Lake Nation, and another is a more general survey of indigenous uh, contemporary issues in America. And he's also uh, the editor of a bilingual academic journal called Oshkabe Wis, which uh, publishes bilingual text in Anishinaabe Mwen and English. He's also helped out with a lot of the immersion schools in the States and the immersion camps. So this guy is really walking the walk uh, that many of us talk, which is that languages are important and are a fundamental criterion of nationhood. But he's going to you know, speak about how you actually put that into practice. So ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Wagash. Ahao, miigwech. Kwe maji tayan ni wiyoji buen bangi, gishpin wi nandige kendemeg in wewenan, weweni go apitain dagwa da abaji tuyen. Wagash ni nindigu minawa migizi and dodem, Anyway, Kwasa Ode, Gazaga Squadji Mekag and Donjiba, Minawa go, Vevenisena, Gedapi Teneminim, Gakina, Gape Jayaguma, Vevenisena, Jiapi Tendemeg, 
on north side and waving on God, Pimina Guizian, and Nishina Baby, and the Digger Cane and Dizuyan, Minawago gave away any sinner, the Arbage Tuing, Niga Nakia, we any sinner, Waiji, Gikane Miguing, Gawian. Quea, Namanji do Gishpinisro Tagua, no Jibwemoyan, Umbin a keg, Anind, Hoa, Onishin. Nui Arbage Tuna, Nayanjago, you owe Nishina Bame, when Minoa go Jagan Ashimu and the Nisido Taguan, Gay Dushi Jima McQueen de Man, Capuin de Mawashiwa, don't go send the Wedge Gay Kane Dasu Jigwain Jibayan. Gishpin we Nishina Bay, we in the Tum, get Arbage Tumin getting way winning on the Tum. Minoa Gishpin we Nishina Bay, we in the Wedge, Washime Jagan Ashiwin, get Arbage Tumin getting way winning on the Wedge, Washime, Arbage Tuing you Jagan Ashimuin, Wangi Arbage Tuyan, Nayanjago. English too? Uh, I'll use both. Yeah, Cree. <laughs> Put me to the test. Yeah, I, um, I'm almost to the point where I have the president and deans at Bemidji State University convinced that if somebody calls and asks for the Department of Foreign Languages to send them to the English department. English is the foreign language. It's a good one. It's a beautiful language too, you know. But uh, I think a lot of times, one of the things in our experience as indigenous peoples is, is one of marginalization and invisibility, sometimes even invisible to ourselves. And as we grapple with really big problems today, substance abuse, poverty, you know, and so forth, a lot of times we lose sight of some of the most important things. It's like we're stuck on tier one of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, working on food, clothing, and shelter, and we forget about everything else. To the point where, you know, we define success as material success. Other kinds of success are way down the priority list. And we, as indigenous people, sometimes internalize someone else's definition of not only what success is, but how to get it. So we forget things like, you know, there's actually a Japanese way of doing business that's really different from the English way, still a good way, right? There's a Chinese way that's really different from the English way, but is still a good way. And there's actually an indigenous way that's really different from all the others that's also a really good way with regards to business, government, culture, all kinds of things. So I think it's important that we develop some perspective. I work at a Bemidji State University, small state university in northern Minnesota. Um, we're right in between the three largest reservations in our state. And so probably 25% of our town's native, maybe half of the shopping population's native. Seems like those worlds don't talk to each other that much, not nearly as much as they should. Sometimes it causes tension. Um, but it's also the case that a lot of our students, K-12, and this is the same in the US and in Canada, but K-12 and then even more so in higher education are not staying the course, all right? Lots of people are scratching their heads, trying to figure out these achievement gap things, which by the way is a profound issue and I think directly, um, can be directly countermanded by a meaningful language revitalization effort. And I'll show you what I mean by that in just a couple minutes. But you know, if we had perfect equity today, we don't, but pretend we did. We know that the gap between people who have money and don't, it's getting wider and wider. The correlation between people who have money and have an education is tighter and tighter. If we had perfect equity, our inability to get First Nations people to the finish line on par with everyone else, that is enough to racialize the economic disparities. Right? That's an important issue to confront. And unfortunately, both with the history of residential boarding schools, you know, in spite of everything positive that has come out of the truth and reconciliation effort, you know, our educational systems today are still largely about assimilation. There is not consistently space for and support of indigenous languages, culture, ways of being, and so if we are still all about the assimilation, it, it's important to bear perspective on this where, you know, if you go to school for 13 years in a row and you learn everything that's important to know, 
to be successful in this world and none of it has anything to do with you. The message becomes that you and yours are not important, are not relevant. And in hearing a message like that, people usually respond with a little bit of resistance, right? It inspires our caveman instincts, fight or flight. Truancy, that's flight. Discipline, well, that's fight. Who wants to embrace their own assimilation? And the few things that pop up are stories from before 1900, and they are stories of tragedy and loss. And who wants to embrace that? Right? All of this compounds. And when you put a tribal language or culture at the center of your educational paradigm, you do the opposite with sometimes stunning results. So one of the things we do for our native students, we try to make sure that we honor them. I'm heartened to hear about the pins and other little you know, incentives and acknowledgements for our native students. We usually have a big banquet, um, you know, celebrate their academic accomplishments. One year we brought in, well, one year I just said, we gotta quit bringing in just academic or political people and bring in someone with a PhD in the School of Life who can speak about you know, a real and relevant, relatable experience, can talk about the importance of language and culture. And I said, okay, who do you got in mind? So I said, well, how about Tom Stilday? He's an elder that is probably known even up here by many of you, um, elder from Panema, which is a community on the Red Lake Reservation, different than many native communities, right? No one there has ever been baptized. 100% traditional religious belief and funeral practice. People bury their dead in the front yard and put spirit houses where everyone's buried. So it's different. You step out the door to your house, there's mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, generation upon generation older than America. Makes it hard to sell a family farm and move to California, you know. He was also the first person named chaplain for the Minnesota State Senate who is not from a Judeo-Christian background. So he'd take out his pipe and he'd open up the State Senate and he'd say, I'm praying for politicians and boy do they need it. <laughs> He's right on about that. So we brought him in and of course he broke every rule for a graduation banquet speech which should be short. A couple good jokes. Focus on the students. He spoke, it was about an hour and a half. We had a mixed audience. It was all in Ojibwe. There wasn't a single word of English. And I'm watching the president and deans kind of glaze over, kind of going like this. When he was all done, he just said one thing in English. He said, all you people who study Indians, study that. And he went and sat down. So I was highly entertained. There's Tom opening up the Senate. But a good point. Usually, when someone has come up with a new Indian plan, it has been pretty horrible and not terribly successful. And it's like that with economics, politics, everything. So one of the secrets to success has to be engaging in the self-stated goals of indigenous people, not being their saviors so much as being their allies, and working cooperatively to achieve those. Being open to some new ideas, because let's face it, everything that's been tried over the past 500 years has not worked. So how about something different? It's not rocket science, right? What's crazy is doing the same thing over and over for 500 years and expecting a different result every generation. I'll give you just a little bit of background on me. Um, I think one, one thing that is very true for me, and I, I think is true for a lot of Native people, is our connection to place, like Tom Stilde and Panema. That place piece is really important. I think also connection to our ancestors in different ways. Um, this is not necessarily the mainstream experience for immigrants, um, where there's a different set of values for people who come voluntarily under coercion or through no choice of their own, like brought here as slaves. Either way, there is a disconnection from motherland and mother tongue, and it has some profound and often painful impacts. But today now, you know, if you get a job in California, dang, move to California and become a Californian, 
because we are messaged about material gains as the definition of success, right? And what happens for so many families, they have two kids, each ends up living in a different state, because that's where the job is, which is separate from wherever the parents live, and to catch up a couple times a year, as often as they can, to try to keep it real. But the emphasis comes down on nuclear family rather than extended family, and connection to ancestors is a luxury that some people lament, but many people are not able to maintain. Might not know the names of their great grandparents or even where they're buried. For me, it's kind of different. I got this guy on the left, John Smith. He was born in the 1700s. He died in the 1900s. So he was in Minnesota when there's no white folk there. He's still in Minnesota when they're sending people off to World War I. Think of what he must have seen. You know? On the right is uh, Wabujig, uh, the younger. His father was probably one of our most celebrated Ojibwe warriors of all time. It's kind of cool having a badass like that in your family tree. Although it comes with its own kinds of baggage, too. Uh, but this is something that's, you know, for me, a foundational part of identity. And when we start talking about language, one of the questions, some of the questions that come up is, how much can a people change and still be the same people? Is it important to be recognizable to one's ancestors? What does that mean? All people change over time now, right? Like, think about the English language, which did not even exist about 600 years ago. All right, that was Geoffrey Chaucer, the first dude trying to write down the English language. I can barely read that stuff, you know? That's only 600 years of change. So when you look at thousands, yeah, I mean, the people who built Stonehenge are different from Englishmen today, right? But they're still from that place, right, from that tradition. So the connections matter. But at what point is it heritage, and at what point is it an unbroken cultural or linguistic strand? Those are questions. Um, for my background, too, my father's a non-native guy. He's uh, straight out of Austria. He's an Austrian Jewish immigrant and actually a Holocaust survivor. Um, turns 90 this year. And he and two cousins and his parents all made it out, and about 300 immediate relatives died in the Holocaust. Yep, he, uh, he was running, made it to eventually to Minnesota, met my mom, and here I am. My mom's on the right there. She grew up in a little town called Bina, which is on the Leech Lake Reservation, 400 residents. Really pretty unbelievable poverty. Um, you know, got ice cream once a year. Knew what it was like to have half a potato every day for a week for supper kind of stuff. The remnants of the house she grew up in amazingly still stand because most people had tar paper shacks and my grandfather couldn't afford a roll of tar paper, but he did have an ax. So the remnants of their little log cabin still stand. We can't even fit all the kids and grandkids shoulder to shoulder in the space. Uh, and so they just throw the chairs out every night. People would lay on the floor. And, you know, she didn't think much of it. But when I was a kid, I guess we were, my folks were getting started. So I do remember, although I never felt like I suffered or that being poor was poor, but um, you know, no electricity, hand pump, kerosene lantern go trade wild rice with the white farmers, you know, for some uh, milk and had a glass jug and sink it in the creek to keep it cold. I thought that was cool, you know. My mother did become the first female native attorney in the state of Minnesota. And by the time I was in middle school, we had a nice house. So I, I kind of feel like uh, when it comes to the American dream, I feel like it is half true. Like, work hard, good morals, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, you two get a piece of sweet American apple pie kind of thing. It's, it's half true. My parents ascended in spite of obstacles. At the same time, it's only half true. There are barriers there for First Nations people that should not be there. And they are there in greater abundance than they are for everybody else. And some of the advantages to like being white, for example, include having your race widely represented in positions of political power, in the curriculum in schools, and in the languages which are supported by your government. And for indigenous people, that's not the case. 
Yeah. Bina made the uh, top 10 list of uh, impoverished communities in Minnesota. Although that is interesting. I pulled that off the internet. That is a picture of a fish house, not somebody's residence. There's my crew. I've got nine kids, so I've been busy. Hey. <laughs> and uh, one grandbaby, one on the way. Yeah. So the crew is growing. I'll probably need a room like this just to do Christmas eventually. This is the view off the front deck of my house. Believe it or not, when my parents were getting started, my father had put in a bid for a piece of tax forfeiture property and got a letter back from the bank. He said, yours is the only bid, but could you please elevate your bid to $359 to cover the delinquent taxes? 500 acres. Yeah. It was originally virgin white pine forest, clear cut, turned into farmland. He started planting trees. And believe it or not, he planted all of the trees that you see there, even on the far shore of that lake. So I got to see physical space transformed really through one person's vision and action. And so I think sometimes when we look at the problems we have in the world today, one of the things that happens is they look so monolithic, so impossible, so intractable and difficult to overcome that we make some tepid efforts we shake our head and say, that's a tragedy. And then we just retreat back to our nuclear family and try to be nice to our kids and hope that's enough. It's not enough. And so one of the things that I think is very important to message is that there are ways to overcome even the most monumental challenges. It is actually possible to revitalize an indigenous language, among other things. Also, sometimes I'm hard to figure out because I'm well-dressed and well-spoken and well-traveled and all that kind of stuff, but I very intentionally turn down jobs that pay me twice as much money to live somewhere other than home. And we do a lot of wild rice harvesting. We do a lot of hunting. Kids snare rabbits. That's all by design. And it's not just that I have, you know, all the grandparents for my kids within 10 minutes of the front door. I actually do. Um, but it's so we can be where we can pursue our traditional life ways. It's vitally important. I feel like the keys to success for me, for my mother, for my siblings, have not just been you know, drive and academic accomplishment, but being OK in our own skins and knowing who the heck we are. By the way, my kids produce over $10,000 worth of food every year. Yeah. Now, there are nine of them, so they consume many times more that amount. <laughs> but they do. A couple grand worth of maple syrup and sugar. We don't buy sugar. Don't need to, you know, harvest a lot of meat. Um, yeah, so they're, sometimes I forget how impressive they are. And even if I have to be on a road or in a place like Winnipeg, they can still get things done, you know, light the boiler for the sugar bush or whatever. I, uh, when my mother went to law school, and this is a, dating myself now. I was born in 1969. Um, but when my mother went to law school, um, I did a couple grades out in Washington, D.C. So I went from being the indigenous, you know, being an indigenous person to being the indigenous person and uh, had some pretty interesting experiences. Among them, I had long hair, and it was a great novelty to the teacher who decided one day to dress me up like a girl in front of class. They had a good laugh. I know, it kind of makes it go, what? You know? And then, you know, being from a long line of ferocious warriors, I decided that I would never even tell my parents. And I didn't until I was an adult. I just came home and said, Mom, I want a haircut. You know? She looked at me and she was like, okay. You know? Like she could tell something else was going on, but she wasn't going to dig. So, got a haircut. College, I grew it out again. Uh, second grade teacher was black, and that was the only teacher of color I have ever had. K-12, college, master's, PhD, I have never had a native teacher, ever. That is typical, by the way. That's not an exception, that's, that's the rule for most of our people. And it has some pretty big impacts. Second grade, you know, that teacher was cool. You know, she treated me like a normal human being. She was left-handed. Dang, I tried to write left-handed. 
You know, she's a black lady, my only teacher of color. Third grade, white teacher. And I had associated race as the reason for my differential treatment. So I refused to speak. And for a scrawny native kid, I put on the best stoic Indian you could ever imagine. <laughs> I even refused to answer direct questions. Anton, I know your name is Anton. Just tell me, what is your name? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so that went on, like, literally for weeks. Finally, you know, they've got me in the office. They're really shaking me down. Something's got to happen here. And, uh, you know, we're, we, we're going to send letters home. You're going to get kicked out of school, blah, blah, blah. Do they speak other languages in your home? Dad speaks German. Mom speaks Ojibwe. Oh, that's the problem. Haul my parents in for a big conference. You know, special ed, speech pathologist, all these different people. And, of course, this is the 70s. So they're like, hello, we need to speak to you about your son. Like, even if it is a language problem, it's not a volume problem, right? <laughs> so, of course, my mom's kind of looking at my dad and says, I'm sorry, could you distill the salient parts of your communication because it doesn't make any sense to us at all? And they're all like, she speaks English, you know. <laughs> of course, she did give me the, uh, you know, whatever, Indian mother, Godzilla, laser vision, death stare. <laughs> I started to speak. Three years off of one moment. And for a lot of people, there are a lot of moments, right? And this is one of the things with, like, the experience about race. I think some people, you know, look around and they see, oh, Baltimore blew up. Ooh, I saw that report on, you know, missing First Nations women, you know, and they see these things and it's hard to connect the dots. Okay, there's some problems. It must be some bad people. They Shame on them. But when you have an experience like that, every day, there are no dots to connect. It is a solid line. And that's one of the differences in those kinds of experiences and treatments. By the way, this is systemic and endemic, and it goes everywhere. Granted, now this is Texas, which is a special place in a lot of different ways. You know, full-blooded Navajo kid, he's in the system as a foster kid. And the school says, well, kids need, boys need hair cut above the collar and don't get to come to school here. And the parents say, but he's native. And they say, well, if you can prove that, you know, bring some sort of documentation that shows he's an enrolled member of a federally recognized tribe. This is ter terminology on the state side, you know. And some sort of documentation that this is an authentic part of their culture. We can ask the school board if they would give an exemption. That's exactly what the parents did. And that's where that kid's going to school. Again, you can imagine all the little dots he has to connect, right? You hear a lot of talk about identity, and language is one of the foundational pieces of this. For indigenous people, all of these things are under a lot of stress and change. It's kind of like we are distinct cultural enclaves. In a society that is rapidly changing, we are swept by this different society that is also rapidly changing. So the pace of change for us is profound, right? When it comes to race, race means a lot of things to different people. So part of that's color, you know, part of that's culture, part of that's consciousness. All of those things matter. But when you look at the color spectrum, we got everything in the color spectrum. We got everything in the culture and language spectrum too. Some people are fluent speakers, some people are steeped in their culture, some people really wish they had access to it and don't know how. You've got everything in between, you know. Place, too, because of the extreme poverty we've endured um, and continue to endure, a lot of people go somewhere else looking for a job. I mean, look at Winnipeg, right? Doesn't mean that people make out that much better, but they're chasing opportunity, right? And it pulls people away from place and challenges like that connection someone like Tom still they had. Language, too, you know, if you are not worried about your language, you should be. Yep. Really, when you look at the world right now, maybe 7,000 languages in the world, at least 1,000 are definitely going extinct within the next several years. And there's another 1,000 after that that are in pretty imminent danger. And really, as you see the proliferation of four primary world languages, you will see much, much more of that. 
even in the absence of intentional colonial actions to take languages away, which is part of the explanation for that, you know, that's not the whole story. Like, look at Lac La Croix, Ontario, which survived the onslaught, you know, residential boarding schools and, and all of it, with a 100% fluency rate where you needed to drive across the ice, take a boat or a float plane to get there. But they did build a road. I, I know you must have four-wheel drive to drive that road, but it's a road. Electricity. Satellite dish. Everyone's watching SpongeBob in English. And the kids start to speak to each other in English, in the absence of somebody telling them, you're not allowed to speak your language. Right? So it's not just the colonial actions, although those had a profound contribution to language loss. All of these things kind of get at stake. Your customs, you know, what do we do for everyday culture? Does the drum go in the center of the room? Have people seen a drum? Does it belong in an institution like this? There's a pretty great event right before this one where they're blessing a drum, giving it to the students and saying, hey, you know, we want to put our native identity at the center of what we do. We need to make intentional actions to do that, and a lot of times they're hard to come by. Same thing with all of these things. Economy doesn't just mean money. It means where do you get your food? Is it from the woods or from the store or, or what? You know, Education, you know, aside from the hand that rocks the cradle, that is the one that has the biggest impact on raising kids. By the way, every First Nation person who is in jail, everyone who died too young, everyone who committed suicide, they all had a teacher first. They also all had family members first. We've had intervention opportunities. And they haven't been used to best effect. So I think it's important to remember that sometimes there's a lot of blame game going on, you know? We look at the, you know, what's happening in criminal justice or something, and we're, you know, there's a lot of finger pointing going on. And a lot of times we blame it on the poverty. Well, if those people can get out of poverty, you know, it, it's all going to go away. But that doesn't just happen, right? When millennials are elders, it doesn't go away. It has to be overcome through intentional action. And it actually can be overcome through intentional action. I've seen it. Our political systems, you know, the status of sovereignty for First Nations, it's, it's complicated and under a lot of pressure. Even our own identity politics and citizenship, things like that are complicated. I think it's important, too, for everyone to realize that fairness is not a given. That has to be made. And it has to be made through intentional actions, right? So, you know, some white dude's not going to come walking out of the bush and say, here's your language on a silver platter. I'm so sorry about the last 500 years. Good luck, right? What are your chances? You know? Not good, right? Not even good chances that they're going to fully fund whatever program you think is important. When it comes to something like that, we have to make our own luck. And those who have, no matter how unfair it might seem, those are the ones who have a chance. And if we are stuck and bogged down in anger, and there's a lot to be angry about. There's enough to keep you angry for generations more. Legitimately. But that's not going to help anybody except for the privileged few who benefit from our system of oppression. So we need to find a way to overcome that. And that's with everything. With sobriety, with you know, returning of land with revitalization of culture, with revitalizing a language, with health. I mean, sure, we got rations of lard and flour and people figured out how to make fry bread so they could survive, but with the highest rate of diabetes for any racial group in the world, that stuff is killing us dead and shaving decades of quality off of people's lives. Whereas things like wild rice and berries and fish boiled, not fried, yeah, you get to look like my ancestor, John Smith. Right? Same thing with all of these things, turning it around on education or economic prosperity. Same thing. 
So a couple questions, and we could easily spend a couple hours just looking at why indigenous languages matter, but I think this is an important place to start whether you already believe in that or not, because a lot of people don't get it, and you're going to need to successfully advocate with them. Uh, ultimately, when you look at any time we have had success around a major social justice issue even, it has not happened because somebody was right or had the right ideas, but simply because they had the right allies and enough of them, right? In the US, like, women's suffrage didn't happen because there were a bunch of dudes smoking cigars saying, should we give our wives and daughters the right to vote? All right. It didn't happen that way. There was a lot of fighting, a lot of advocacy, decades of it. Those in the disenfranchised position had to demand that finally recruit just enough allies to bring the subject up and affect political change in a meaningful way. Same thing with the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King was not the first person who said, you know, Jim Crow laws suck, right? But he was the first one to march on Washington, D.C. with a quarter of a million people, many of whom were white, who said, it's an affront to everyone's humanity and this needs to change now. That was a big difference, allies. And as native people, because we are small in number, because we spend a lot of our time and energy working on our internal issues and problems, for better and for worse, because we are underrepresented in positions of power economically, academically, politically, we are imagined often, understood infrequently, and we really need lots of allies to effectively understand and support our positions. So, that doesn't mean that somebody else should be in the leadership position, right? Inspired by indigenous people is not as effective as inspiring indigenous people. But there is a dynamic that we need to be intentional about cultivating. Language impacts a lot of things. There is a distinct way of looking at the world that is embedded in language. All languages are loaded with meaning, right? Like English has words like sarcasm, which really comes from Latin. Sark is flesh, chasm to tear. When you know that, it adds meaning to your understanding of the word, right? With Ojibwe, when you speak to first speakers of the language, they'll say a couple things. One thing they say is, first of all, well, it's just funnier in the language, right? Because you speak on kind of two meanings. There's the literal definition of what something means, and then there's the way the word is used. So, gibudie guazanug, pants, right? D is the hind end, you know? Gibudie guazanug. Yeah, so it's, it's really like something that sews up your hind end. So, <laughs> So, you know, I suppose people had, you know, breech cloth and leggings or a skirt, and let's face it, it's cold here, right? So you got to go, whoop, whoop, and you're done. And here came these strange people who had to take the whole works down and freeze for a long time just to take care of the most basic bodily function. So they say, yeah, gibudie guazanug. Now here I am speaking to you today wearing my gibudie guazanug, right? And it's not like a cultural value, but even when you say the word, it often elicits a little chuckle because there's a different layer of meaning there. So it happens with the silly things. You'll also hear first speakers say, when you tell a story, it's more like you're painting a picture because there's this thicker layer of description that comes across, nuances and deeper meanings. And you know they're, they're hard to spell out, but they are there. Some things do get lost in translation. Ni yao is my body. And in our way, our belief is that, you know, it's not so much like we have souls, it's more like we are souls. We have bodies for a little while. It's not like we're human beings looking for a spiritual experience. We're more like spirits having a temporary human experience. When a baby is born, his or her spirit enters the body, stays there as long as we live. When we die, our body is a cup that holds that spirit and eventually goes back to dirt. 
but the spirit lives forever, right? And even our funeral rites are vested in instructing that departing soul on how to get where they need to go, powering them up with teachings and songs in preparation for that. So, ni yao, my body, my cup, ni eh, my namesake. If I give a name to somebody, it's like I'm taking something out of my cup and I'm putting it into somebody else's. This is ni yao, this is ni eh. And we would use that word reciprocally to invoke that understanding. You see it in many other things, like our, our word for an elder, gichiaya'a, great being. Literally, great being. Mindemuye, elderly woman. That, that really is um, like one who holds things together, describes the role of the family matriarch. But boy, in English, what do you got? I mean, old woman, elderly woman, aged woman, you know? No wonder, yeah, it's a, it's, an, it's a pretty ageist culture, it is. And we trip people up so badly with this value where we expect you to be young forever. And no, no wonder nobody wants to admit how old they really are, wants to dye their hair all the time, Botox injection, facelift, whatever, you know? Like trying to preserve an unattainable definition of worth, and especially for women, you know? It's messed up, right? Like the primary value is your ability to be sexually attractive so you can get a man because the man is the key to your success kind of stuff. That's what gets messaged. And it's really messed up. Whereas if your goal is to be a great being, then there's always something to live for. You know? It's like that with many other things, like we bless this drum today. De means heart or center, so you see it in words like odeamin, heart-shaped fruit or strawberry. You see it in odeina, the village, the heart or center of where people come together. You see it in, you know, deweagun, heartbeat for the drum. You see it in uh, dodeim, clan, heart or center of who we are spiritually. It's easier to create words in Ojibwe. Right? You see a TV and people are like, oh, Mazanate Sijigan, that's a box that reflects an image through light. Maz is just an image. You see it in other words too, Mazanayagan, so forth. Even words like Gikawabaman, it's our belief that, you know, we are ever living spirits. When we part, we don't say goodbye, but simply, I'll see you again or I'll see you later. I like this quote by, uh, Hod and Carter, there are but two lasting bequests we can hope to give our children. The first of these is roots, the other wings. And I think we focus on the wings a lot, you know? Finish school, spread your wings, fly, go on, get out of here, you know? Banaja, fly the nest. But it's important to focus on those roots too. They're foundational for identity and for success. This quote sometimes rubs people the wrong way, but there's an interesting statement here. If you no longer speak your language and no longer practice your culture, then you have no right to demand aboriginal rights from us because you are assimilated with the ruling class. Now, I wouldn't say it quite that way. But if this is what some people are thinking and saying, whether you agree or not, one of the cornerstones for true sovereignty has to be what is truly distinctive, right? If we are totally the same, is everyone else, why do we need something different from everyone else? It's a good question. If you have a hard time convincing your own folks of that, good luck convincing everybody else. Even the United Nations, when it looks at criteria for recognition, they have these things, a living language, a living identifiable culture, and a sovereign land base. There's Anna Gibbs, by the way. She's recording uh, public service announcements for the Affordable Care Act, believe it or not. It's important that we focus on what's real and relevant. And our language is real. Languages are real and relevant. We have history. That doesn't mean we are history. We are ancient and modern. We're over 10,000 years of astonishing human history still in the making. What's in the way? Some of this is pretty obvious, but we've seen the proliferation of, you know, four predominant world languages to the exclusion of others. 
when you want access to information and access to opportunity, it's often channeled through those languages. Um, we've seen pushback, and by the way, there is tremendous pushback in Canada. In the States, it's, it's, I mean, it's terrifying. I mean, sometimes it's funny watching Trump, and sometimes it's terrifying. You know? Like, casual racism. You know? Rampant, blatant dishonesty. You know? And tapping into anger as the motivating force behind politics rather than like building something, making something better. It's more about keeping them away, whoever they are. Essentially, it's a profound acknowledgement of the oppression in our society. What's really scaring some people is the fear that we will flip roles between who is the oppressor and who is the oppressed. And so people fight really hard to preserve the sanctified benefits that especially white males have received as the primary beneficiaries of oppression. And I think all of that energy should instead be directed to tackling oppression so the system works for everybody. That's the, that's the problem. That's why you get the English only laws. That's why you get all the you know, immigration politics. It doesn't mean, you know, that someone should be okay to circumvent the law, but you know there are a lot of problems with the laws. And there are horrible inequities that need to be attended to. A lot of the other issues that pop up are funding, or really the lack of it. The need for resources, you need dictionaries, you need 5,000 young reader books in your language loaded into an accelerated reader system with assessments so teachers can plug it right into what they do. You need all that stuff. You need the operating system on your iPhone speaking your language, because uh, unless you're going to go Amish, so to speak, and wall yourself off from the rest of the world, you know, which is ex exceptionally hard to do even for the Amish, you need the world you live in to be speaking your language, right? The educational medium is a foreign language. It's English or it's French, right? All those things impact. By the way, there's a great article called White Fragility. That's pretty useful in how do you tackle this political landscape. And essentially what it says is this. White folk in places like the US and in Canada have been highly insulated from racial discomfort, right? Can travel around Europe, can go around Africa, own a house in Costa Rica. Someone will always accommodate you in English, right? And it's like that with everything else, too. Not just language comfort, but cultural comfort, and so forth. And so two things happen. One is the musculature that gets exercised by being uncomfortable, atrophies, right? You go to the gym, you work out, it hurts. You work out again, you get stronger. You go again, you're buff, right? For me, man, I am out there. It is always uncomfortable. It is always uncomfortable. Someone is always misunderstanding. I get asked twice a month, do you work here in the inappropriate, do you work here situation, like at Home Depot, where everybody who works there is wearing a blaze orange apron that says the Home Depot, <laughs> you know? And I've either got nine kids hanging off of my cart or I'm dressed like this. Can you go clean up aisle three? What? You know? Where do I get the wrenches? Back corner of the garden center, you know? But, you know, I'm used to that, I expect that, so it doesn't ruin my day, usually. Right? So I am like the Hulk. Also, the second thing that happens is there is an unreasonably high expectation to always be racially comfortable for those who never have to experience the discomfort. I expect to be uncomfortable, and disappointment is inversely proportional to my expectations, so, you know? But when someone else is saying, ooh, black lives matter, what? You know? So, I think for white folk, expect discomfort. Listen. Listen when you're not comfortable. Be recruitable as an ally rather than the savior. Listen to the self stated goals of indigenous people for what they want. They include our language. And figure out how to support that.
Internally within our communities, we have all kinds of issues. Oppression permeates our culture, our communities, and we house the oppressor inside of us. It's not just crabs in the bucket. We live in an environment steeped in internalized and lateral oppression. There's a lot more to say about that. Probably won't get into it too much today, but happy to go there when we take your questions. I think there's just a fundamental lack of awareness, involvement, commitment. We identify with whiteness and exhibit that. You look at one of the few tribes that has actually done something in America, like eliminate poverty, like the Seminole Nation. They eliminated poverty for their citizenry. They're that wealthy. They own the Hard Rock Cafe Enterprise worldwide. And uh, there was a budget shortfall in the state of Florida. They wrote a check and filled the budget shortfall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sir, there will be no state proliferation of gaming in the state of Florida, sir. And I will have your ideas on the top of my agenda for the governor's conference when I speak to the president of the United States. Sir, you ask them what keeps you up at night? They always say language and culture loss. So my fear is that a lot of our tribal leadership, with the best of intentions, is looking at you know, food, clothing, shelter needs. And, and they're working on economic prosperity and political empowerment, which are legitimate concerns. But my fear is that they're going to be climbing this mountain and getting higher and higher and get to the top and look around and go, oh, crap. We just climbed the wrong mountain. People want to know, how did I do it? So here's my grandmother. She's a survivor from residential boarding schools. Her name's Luella. Here's my youngest kid who's a little older now. Her name's Luella, too. We had the same experience that a lot of families have had of the colonial experience, the war against language, and so forth. I, uh, for me, by the way, I went to Princeton University, and I, I thought I was getting away from all of the problems, and that was really naive, because those are like the dumbest smart people I ever met. And um, kind of to the horror of my parents, I graduated from college with plans to walk the earth, which I did successfully for a while, like a couple years and eventually went to grad school. But um, I stumbled across this guy here, Archie Mose, who is an elder from the St. Croix Reservation in Wisconsin. And uh, you know, he, he was just a really well-known, well-respected spiritual leader. And I was going to him for ceremony. And it was really weird. He, uh, you know, I, his kids were even born in wigwams and stuff like that. He was, uh, he was a teenager, first time he ever saw a white man. And in his 30s, first time he saw a black man. When I walked into his tiny little house, he was watching WWF Smackdown on a TV and laughing really loud. You know, he saw a lot of change in his life. But I walked in and he said, oh, I've been waiting for you. It's like, waiting for me? How, you don't even know who I am. And apparently he had a dream and he just cast the door open. And so I ended up living in his house. I was his gopher, I drove him around, but he, I took him to the bank one time. He had a tiny little pension check. He used to work for a highway department and he couldn't cash it. He was not literate in English. He could kind of speak English, but he was for the most part a fairly monolingual Ojibwe speaker. Um, and so I got a real immersion experience. And I, I think even though I had a lot of exposure, very intentionally from my mother, um, hauling us around to ceremonies and stuff, I got to meet Danny Thomas and others, and my mom was doing that. You know, I think that um, that was a foundational experience too. But then having the opportunity to really be in a language-rich environment, anybody who learns a language is going to do that one way or another. Whether you're doing it in an immersion school, living in somebody's house, growing up as a kid, you need the airtime. Any kid speaking any language is going to have a full year of listening before they utter their first word. When are you going to get your year? You know? And, uh, and there are other things we can do to accelerate that. That's Archie with the Dalai Lama. We took him to the conference on world religions and. It kind of looked alike, really. But the, the Dalai Lama came up with this big, long line of monks. And they really wanted to meet this famous spiritual leader. So they're all coming up and bowing. Of course, Archie didn't know what to do, so he just started patting him on the head. Uh, uh, that's OK. Uh, that's all right. Uh, uh, it's OK. So then the Dalai Lama stops. He says, well, well, what do you do? He says, I don't know. You shake hands. So he goes like this. He goes, no, like this. So I got the Indian handshake for the Dalai Lama. Oh, that's good. You know, I found for me too, um, people will sometimes say I had a lot of opportunities, but I, I have to say that I, I had to make those opportunities. It started right there, you know, 
put down tobacco to make tobacco. So one of the forms we make is out of the inner bark of red willow, right? And you carve off the outer bark, you use the inner bark, and then you're off ricing or whatever you need to do. So I really do believe that a spiritual endeavor, like learning a language, should be a spiritual process, that that's the place to start. I always felt like I had help when I needed it, you know? There's a reason for everything. Sometimes the reason is I'm stupid and make bad choices, right? And, uh, but sometimes, you know, I do also believe that, you know, there's a plan for everybody and it can be interfered with by good luck, bad luck, blind random luck, and by our intentional choices and actions. So, you know, Forrest Gump wise, Lieutenant Dan and Mama, they're both right. There's a lot in the cultural toolbox more than we'll be able to do here, but some of these things were foundational for me, connected with language and identity. You know, going fasting was really, really profound in a lot of different ways. Even something as simple as a first kill feast, you know, where we would, uh, you know, speak and bless the food, and instead of just eating, you know, we'd have one of the providers who would take a spoon of the food and offer it up and say the native name, you know, Wagush. No. I'm thinking about children who don't have enough to eat. Ah, okay. Wagush. No. I'm thinking about elders who can't get out in the woods to hunt for themselves. Wagush. No. I'm thinking about my family, my community, the people who came here today to support me. Ah. Wagush. And then could eat. We do this with all the kids, by the way, every time someone gets their first kill. And then we'll just say, you just changed your life. Because up till today, you depended on everybody in this room to provide 100% of your food. Today, you provide for all of them. Now, that's what it means to be an adult. You'll always have this special power through your hunting, through your fishing, through your job. Whenever you have resources, you think of children who don't have enough, elders who can't get it for themselves, your family, your community, the people who support you. They give away their first kill. They're impoverished but rich. There were so many things like that on the journey. Foundational. So different from like rugged individualism, accumulate resources, see the power of compounding interest, and keep them so you can pass them to your children as an inheritance, but to heck with everybody else. Now, I do believe in the power of compound interest too. You know? But at the same time, we need to operate from our values, and they are embedded in our language and cultural practices. So as I went to grad school, I was thinking, I'll do oral histories. And so things like this, like the Warrior Nation book, did a lot of oral histories with people in the language and kind of used those stories as a way to tell the history, um, but also did all the archival work there, too. I got to tell you. I've been so privileged, and I was just going to the can before this talk, and I was looking there, and there's something for a Hawaiian field program, which is pretty cool. We do, we do one, and it's, it's an indigenous-focused Hawaiian field program, but it is so stunning. This is the first indigenous group in the U.S. that successfully revitalized an indigenous language. Um, and here's kind of what they did. They, at their lowest point, were down to 1,000 speakers which is as low as you can go and have any hope of coming back, really. Today, there are over 20,000 speakers. Over 3,000, it is their first language learned in the home. You can go to school, Hawaiian medium, meaning it is the medium of instruction, K-12 and college, including getting your teaching degree with all your methodology courses in the Hawaiian language, come back and teach for your people. Full pipeline. Right? When they started, just a little over 30 years ago, their language was illegal. Today, it is one of the official languages for the state of Hawaii. And that's pretty amazing, isn't it? When you speak to the Hawaiians, why did you do that? The reasons they offer are not always what you would expect. They say, well, and this is so resonant for me as an Ojibwe person, because we have the whole you know, your body's a cup thing and whatnot. And, and they say, well, it's like this. There's three sources of spiritual fire, what we call maoli, right? The spirit 
comes through the soft spot on the top of a baby's head. This is exactly the same for us. It resides here in your head. Your head is a sacred vessel. And they say, pico is your belly button. That's your connection to your mother. There's as a matrilineal line through your ancestral generations all the way back. You know, your genitals is your future generations. Three sources of Maoli. Fire. Well-tended fire grows strong. Neglected fire grows weak. We teach Hawaiian language to generate strong Maoli. That's how we tend the fire. Their ancient custom, like when a belly button would fall off on a baby, they'd carve a little divot in the lava rocks, put the belly button there, put a rock on top. Next baby's born, same thing. In a line, they'd remember their spots. When the girls grow up and become a mother, they put a circle around her divot, and her babies go there too, and it looks like that. And it is amazing when you go to the petroglyphs, and it is acres and acres of divots and circles. All bonding people to their part of the Aina, Mother Earth bonding them in their ancestral lines all the way back. Strong pico, right? They even have teachings like, you know, little babies need to be close to home. Kids can go to school. They can learn about the rest of the world, but they got to stay on their island. You know, adults can actually, once they have kids, can go out and travel and represent their community. Elders need to come back home and transfer Maoli to the young ones. They started a language nest. They grew it one year at a time into a full-fledged Hawaiian medium program, even at the college level. They did not have funding. By the way, they do not have federal recognition or sovereignty in the eyes of the United States government, but they did all of that. They fought political battles. They recruited allies. They built resources. They built schools. They said, we're not going to wait for the funding. We're just going to do it, and they did. It's, it's really, really stunning. And so many other things. There's so much more to say there. but. Um, you know, when people matriculate a child to the school, the families have to pick medicines. The families meet together and weave those medicines together in a giant lay that goes before the door to the school. When you go to school, all the kids are piling out of cars, they are piling out of buses, and the entire staff is waiting in front of the school. And by the entire staff, I don't just mean the teachers, I mean every janitor, every cook, every administrator, every teacher, they're all in lines in front of the school. The kids start piling out and they face them in lines. So it takes a while, it's just while everyone's assembling. Once they're assembled, the kids have to sing. And what they're singing for is permission to come into the school. When they're done, if the staff feels they're sincere, they sing back. And then every kid gets a hug from every single staff member, every single day. And they walk through their medicine lay into the school. So startup takes a long time, you know? And we say double down on your common core, English language, math, English, math, English, math. And sometimes less is more. Sometimes slower is faster. They have no truancy issues. They have a high completion rate, and they have great academic success. We are trying so hard to replicate this in Ojibwe country. This is Rose Tainter fighting for the first Ojibwe language immersion school in the United States, which is located on the Lacoudere Reservation by Hayward, Wisconsin. There is so much that they do that is so amazing. But among the most amazing things that they do, while 50% of Native kids in the United States of America fail state-mandated tests in English and math, they have, for 15 years in a row, had a 100% pass rate. Now, everyone's trying to figure this stuff out. How do you do it? But dang, if somebody has figured it out, maybe we should pay more attention to that. What it says is, when you don't just have to learn about others and otherness, and try to be something you are not and could never be accepted to be. When you are empowered to be who you are in your own skin, that generates engagement with everything else. By the way, they have profound academic rigor there. I do assessments for them. It's amazing. They have an integrated curriculum. They'll pack up all the whole school and they'll go out to harvest wild rice. And they'll do something like this. They'll say, Anish minik manominge tuyingo maji maning. Like, how much rice can we fit in this canoe? And they're all like, okay, rectangle, they're making measurements. Okay, triangle, triangle, calculate. 
you know, fill the canoe full of water, pour it into cylinders. Okay, we got that right. Tobacco offering, launch the canoes. Okay, second graders, you know, life cycle of a plant. That's in your standards. They got to learn, learn that, you know. Nutrition unit, you know. They harvest the rice. They parch the rice. They jig the rice. They winnow the rice. They have a feast in the, you know, parent involvement. And then they're saying, okay, if rice was a staple, how much would you need for one person to survive for a year? And if you had a thousand people in your village, how much rice would you need? They're doing all their math and they're all like, wow, our ancestors did that. Right? So you've delivered the science, the health, the nutrition, the geometry, the math, and the culture. And it's all delivered in the language. You don't have to make extra time in the day and fight for it. It's the medium of delivery. I've seen other things too. Here's one of our good white allies in Bemidji, Michael Muir's. He said, hey, you go to Hawaii, everybody knows what aloha means. They come to Bemidji, Bemidji they should know what buju anin and miigwech mean. Campaign for bilingual signage with zero dollars, grassroots, the hospital, regional event center, all of the public schools and hundreds of businesses have now put up these signs. It doesn't make the big problems go away, but it makes a little safe space where we can talk about the big problems. It was a start. It was an acknowledgement. Every journey is going to start with a step, and so those symbolic things matter. We just got done posting the tribal flags in the, in the courthouse in Bemidji, you know, and things like that. Those are symbolic gestures, but they speak to an effort to acknowledge, support, and appreciate allies and to expand the effort into other areas. So never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. I'll just give you a gloss over on some of the resource work because some people are wondering, how do you get over a dialect war? How do you get over a writing system war? How can you get started when our own people are ripping us up and that kind of stuff? So a couple ideas that might be helpful to you and resources out there. There's a free online talking dictionary for Ojibwe. It, one of the nice things about this is you can just add new entries. It's not Wikipedia, so it goes through an academic forum, but um, you, that way you can accommodate male and female speakers, multiple dialects, and so forth. So it's really useful and can, can continually grow. We've worked on vocabulary projects. I tried to get some of our Jedi masters of Ojibwe language together. And at first it was really hard because they just said, I don't care about algebra. Teach them who we are. And I said, but there's a billion people in China learning all about algebra that doesn't reduce their Chineseness at all because they're doing it in Chinese. Help us do this in Ojibwe. You know? And so this is one of the tensions you bump up against. Developing literary traditions for an oral language. Developing new terminology so you can accommodate the challenges of the time. This is something that has happened with all languages and cultures. Right? If you just want to keep it ancient, it'll just be a prayer language. And it won't be an everyday language. We have to be able to grow. So we do something like this. We put up a picture and, you know, we'd say, okay, we wanted a word like condensation or something like that. And pretty soon they'd say, oh, you mean like when there's water, like on the grass in the morning? I was like, yeah. I said, oh, well, here's how we'd say it. And someone said, that's not how we say it where I'm from. And so we'd say, oh, you're both right. Two entries. You know, no dialect war. So we had multiple dialects, seven dialects represented working on these things. And, uh, and so we, they started to cross-pollinate. So someone like Gordon Jourdain, who was raised by monolingual speakers and worked on carpentry, had words for angle, pitch, square footage kind of stuff. Other people wouldn't necessarily, but they'd hear the words and they'd say, oh yeah, that makes sense. Here's how we'd say it where I'm from. Okay. And so you're actually even growing that way. You know? And by the way, with condensation, we actually have a lot of texture-based words, so there's different words to condense on grass as opposed to condense on glass, as opposed to condense in the air, right? So we captured all those, it was fun. You know, same thing with uh, stories. You know, at first people would, would feel comfortable talking about what life was like when they were a kid or a story they had already heard, and we wanted new material. And so, uh, you know, we brought in, again, being naive, I, th I thought, we're bringing some of our very talented artists, we have such rich artistic traditions, and we'll work on storyboards and go. And at first, people looked at me like I was crazy. We had to spend more time on, OK, what was it like when you were a kid? Someone like Nancy Jones, who's from Red Gut First Nation in Ontario, would say, um, well, I just got bossed around, sent to grandma's house, made to do chores, bring in the wood, whatever. So we said, well, let's take a, a character, like somebody 
you know, migazines from representing one of our clans, but put him in a modern context, like sitting at the breakfast table. She's like, yeah, listening to his iPod. I was like, of course he's listening to his iPod, you know? And then what? And she's like, send him to grandma's house. Okay, send him to grandma's house, and then what? You know, you know, grandma's bossing him around. And then she'd say, like there's this saying, like I'm giving you a gray hair, right? It's like a way of saying, you get to be an elder too someday, you're gonna earn him one gray hair at a time, now go clean the floor, you know? And, the, and then what? She goes, send him to the other grandma's house? It's like, of course, you know? <laughs> Come back home and it, it takes seven years for an eagle's head to turn white. And so then he's complaining to mom, and mom says, hey, look in the mirror. And he's like, ah, oh. you know, <laughs> story. So once you had the storyline, culturally relevant, but new and creative, then Nancy could look at that outline and be like, done. So we were able to knock out like 20 of those in a weekend with the team. It was pretty cool. If you're interested in more of what's going on with Ojibwe immersion schools in the U.S. side, the first speaker's documentary, which is available for free online. You can Google that or go to tpt.org. Um, give you an idea of what's going on there. You know, I, I get asked some questions, by the way. Um, so I, when we started, I told you a little bit about my mom and uh, kind of growing up in this impoverished community. My grandmother, who went through the residential boarding school experience, and... Um, I think, you know, when my, after, as my mother was raised and came into her adulthood, she made some really intentional decisions around language and culture that had a really resounding impact on us. Uh, I think most people are like water coursing down a mountain, right? We just follow the gorges and streams and the paths of least resistance. But sometimes someone tries to divert the flow or cut a new channel or things like that. And I think she was one of those kind of people. Her siblings did not, and they, they took life as it came and often paid the price. So uh, we actually buried one of my uncles this year. He just basically burned his liver out, drinking. Um, had another one who died from a drug overdose. Had an aunt who committed suicide. Had a grandfather, decorated veteran, D-Day, Omaha Beach, committed suicide in his mid-80s. You know, so we saw that stuff. At the same time, my mom's got four kids, so one's a medical doctor. We consider him the loser. Yeah. Uh, my sister's a lawyer and a judge. Um, my brother and I both have PhDs, published 20-some books between us. Must have close to 20 grandbabies uh, for my mom and dad, and everyone, no drug addicts, and everyone says, okay, how the hell did you do that? And she'll say, well, I don't know exactly, but I do know this. I valued education. But by that, I don't just mean education from books. I don't just mean other people's values, credentials, and ways of being. I made sure my kids knew how to snare rabbits and pick wild rice and went to ceremonies and had exposure to their language and to their culture. And that ultimately made all the difference in the world because nothing can stop an indigenous person who knows who he or she is. With that, I will say miigwech and take time for questions. Thank you. Well, one or two questions and then we'll break. Go ahead. Great question. I don't know if you could hear the question, but how do we get started when we have so much divide and conquer? How do we um, you know, overcome the complacency in the places where the language is alive and light a fire in the places you know, where it's not? So uh, I guess I would say this, first of all, you got to get started somehow. When the Blackfeet got started with Pygon Institute, they started with one elder, fluent speaker, one kid, and one second language learner. That was it. But they said, we're starting, and we're starting now, and we will never stop once we start. And they did. Um, I think you're right. It has to start with the kids. Ideally, everyone's going to grow up a fluent speaker, but if it has to start in the home, for many of our families, it will never start. So we have to look at other ways to systemically leverage language growth. That's where, you know, a language, target language rich environment like an immersion daycare, an immersion school, um, you know, I kind of even like the word, you know, 
Ojibwe medium, Cree medium school, so because immersion can sometimes mean different things to different people. But whatever the terminology, you want that language to be the medium of instruction. Uh, so you don't have to fight for airtime. You don't have to justify the use of your own culture. Um, and you can deliver things our way. Miigwech, thank you so much.